This is Need to Know. Real talk about the reality of unidentified aerial phenomena. From Australia, Ross Coltart. From the US, Bryce Zabel. Hey everybody. A lot keeps happening between our shows here at Need to Know, which either proves that UAP news is being made faster than ever or that we need to do shows more often. The last time we were here was a few days before the recent Senate UAP hearing. We debated doing a show the day of the hearing full of hot takes and maybe a celebrity guest like we did with Lou Elizondo a year ago last May on the day of the first House hearing. This time, though, Ross and I decided we would take a few days to think about what we saw and heard in that hearing instead of a hot take, give you, I don't know, maybe a warm analysis. Both of us have been busy in that time, though. Ross has been on assignment for Channel 7 Australia, and I've been working on a couple of writing projects because it's increasingly likely that as a member of the Writers Guild of America, I'll be on strike on May 2nd. And a strike means pencils down and hitting the picket lines instead of pounding the keyboards. In this show, we'll be talking about that UAP hearing, but we'll also touch on those rumors about what stories whistleblowers have already told Congress, plus that leak of documents on the Discord platform, also the high-level, classified intelligence briefing that just took place at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And of course, we'll want to give a bit of analysis to the firings of Tucker Carlson from Fox and Don Lemon from CNN, because both of them have expressed on-air opinions about the issue of UAP UFO reality. So, there's a lot to get to. Let me bring in my cohort, direct from the road in Australia, Ross Goldart. Hey, Roscoe, maybe you can tell us what you've been working on. G'day, Bryce. How are you, mate? What's that Chinese curse? May you live in interesting times. Very my true. goodness me, mate. What? I, I, there's so much going on. I'm so excited. I've just read Josh Boswell's Daily Mail story where he's revealed what... I've known for a long time that quite a few people have come forward to the Congress as well also to the AARO, the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, with direct first-person information about what we call the program. And uh, yes, I've been speaking to some of those people myself, and I am in absolutely no doubt, absolutely no doubt that these witnesses are making these claims that they are real people with defense intelligence credentials and they want to talk they want the public to know what they know and uh, by golly i do think we are starting to get some momentum here my friend things are getting very very interesting well it, you know it, it certainly was a moment of cognitive dissonance if you will watching sean kirkpatrick the new head of arrow testify because he started, I mean, first of all, the man looked like he was in a bad mood. I don't know if that's his normal nature. <laughs> he looked uh, like a Mr. Cranky Pants, didn't he? Honestly, I I, I don't think he wanted to be there. I, I, I just had this, he, he had that look like he was the surly boy at the back of the class who, who frankly didn't like having the teacher demanding to know whether he'd done his homework. And uh, he just looked pissed. You know, I don't know the man, uh, but I will say I didn't like the man I saw at the hearing. I just felt like he could have tried a little harder to sound a little less pissed off and a little more uh, open. And and it really did. When I say cognitive dissonance, he kept acting like, OK, nothing to see here so far. We got nothing really impressive to talk to you folks about yet, which is OK. I guess that's one way to look at it. But. You and I both know, and so so does that article in the Daily Mail from Josh Boswell, we know from personal experience that he's had people come in and tell him some pretty hair-raising stories. Now, maybe he has to try to validate some of those stories, but I don't think that's any reason he had to behave the way he did. Yeah, I think this is the key issue, Bryce. The key issue now is what's going to happen next? Are the public going to be told what, frankly, I know? I know the Congress knows. I know senior congressmen and, and senators have been briefed in very extreme detail, right down to program names, code names, key officials, locations of storage of material. I know this information has and is being given to Congress by loyal, patriotic Americans who've decided it's time this story be told. And what the uh, mails revealed this morning, that there are six whistleblowers who've claimed 
that they worked on military UFO programs, retrieving and analyzing crash material from non-human technology. I'm told that's true. Now, I, don't, I haven't seen these craft. I haven't seen these objects, but I'm told these whistleblowers are coming forward. They're testifying under oath. They're, they're people who are prepared to put their their lives on the line by basically coming forward to Congress. And lawyer Danny Sheehan said he's in contact with them, that he's assisting them and representing them before the Congress. They're claiming they've worked on Roswell-style UFO crash retrieval and reverse engineering programs. And I know, I know, because I've spoken to people on the inside, there are people who have come forward to Congress, who have testified with this information. They've given very specific detail. Now, the big question is whether the United States government, the United States military decides to do the honourable thing and finally fess up about what they know. We are, I think, my friend, at a very important moment in history. Uh, this is a very key time. It's uh, what we call an inflection point. Uh, you know, clearly... Uh, something is going on. Uh, our friend uh, George Knapp uh, from the Weaponized podcast this week said he used the number 24 different whistleblowers who have met with uh, Sean Kirkpatrick. So whether it's six or 24, this is a lot of information that this man uh, is being given and sitting on. And I, I did think his statement, I don't have it in front of me, but where he said, basically, uh, we've seen nothing that would indicate this is extraterrestrial, which was kind of a way to tamp down expectations. Um, it doesn't seem like a legitimate thing to be saying if he's actually been receiving people that say, I can tell you what the name of the program was. I can tell you where it was run. I can tell you what's in it. I can tell you who worked on it. I mean, those are things that, that can be looked into. So if there are hearings in the future, and, and as you and I have reported in our last podcast, we think they may be even scheduled for June 13th, they should be a little more explosive affair than, than Sean Kirkpatrick. And if I may, uh, I just want to talk about the optics of that hearing for a moment. You know, maybe I've seen Godfather 2 too many times, uh, but I had this image of Michael Corleone and Godfather 2 testifying to this Senate committee with the brown, beautiful uh, wood paneled walls and with a you know, large section for an audience. And instead, what we got was a couple of tables that looked like they'd been put together. And frankly, you know, as someone who's, you know, run television shows, that's what you do for a production meeting. You take a bunch of tables, push them together. People get around the table and talk about what they're going to shoot for the, the week. Well, the truth is that those tables not only looked cheap and, and, and low rent, but there was nobody at them. To the best of my knowledge, three people showed up for that that hearing and the rest were missing. Why is that? Well, the key issue, frankly, my friend, is that if the public, if the American public don't tell the Congress and don't tell their senators and representatives that they want this information to be brought out, it won't be. The Congress will sit on it and the Defense Department and the intelligence community will win the day. That's simply what we are at at the moment. You might say it's an inflection point, but the simple fact is in the testimony that was put forward by Sean Kirkpatrick, he testified, quote, Aro has found no credible evidence thus far of extraterrestrial activity, off-world technology, or objects that defy the known laws of physics. In the event sufficient scientific data were ever obtained that a UAP encountered can only be explained by extraterrestrial origin, we are committed to working with our interagency partners at NASA to appropriately inform US government leadership of its findings. Now, the simple fact is that Sean Kirkpatrick knows stuff behind the scenes from witnesses who've come forward. And one of those witnesses is quoted in Josh Boswell's story, Hal Putoff. Hal Putoff has testified that he has told uh, Sean Kirkpatrick of what he knows about crash retrievals programs. So the simple fact is, is, is Kirkpatrick playing a neat game? Is he playing a neat game where basically he doesn't accept witness evidence as credible? And this is the perennial argument that occurs in this debate. If somebody says they've seen something, are they a witness? Are they credible? Well, yes, they are. In law, they are. So Mr. Kirkpatrick had better be very careful because he's now testifying before the Congress. 
and he has to be very sure that he doesn't mislead the Congress. And I appreciate he's a scientist, and as a scientist, he may want to say, in order for something to be credible, he needs to see it and verify it and scientifically analyse it and confirm it. All being said and well, that's, that's true. But we're now in a case where he's testifying before the Congress, admittedly not under oath, but it is still an offence to lie or mislead the Congress. And I think he and other people need to start being very, very careful because, frankly, I know what he knows. And a lot of people know what he knows. We're at a very interesting point now here where public officials are testifying about things. And I think to use a, a lovely quotation that I re- call from a British cabinet secretary way back in my early career when he was caught out fibbing about the um, spy catcher MI6 witness that was trying to publish a book in Australia. He was caught out being economical with the truth. And I think people people need to be very, very careful that they're not being economical with the truth because witness evidence is evidence. It's, it certainly is. And, and frankly, in journalism, uh, which is what we're practicing, it's certainly evidence. You know, Sean's uh, quote uh, that said, we have no evidence that it's extraterrestrial would have gone down a little better if he didn't say it was such a sneer and was such, uh, you know, obvious uh, wishing he could be, get out of that room. I do think you're right, though. There is a lot of cherry picking of how to exactly say things. And it forces uh, when uh, news coverage to sort of have to... Uh, you know, try to read between the lines. So for example, uh, when he says there's no evidence that it's extraterrestrial, well, a lot of us aren't saying it's extraterrestrial. We we don't know. We we do know it's probably not US technology or Chinese or Russian technology. So it's from somebody that's anomalous uh, and that may or may not be ET. So the, the choice of saying extraterrestrial uh, may have been a dodge. Also, I keep noticing people, you said it in, I believe, in the in the Daily Mail article uh, that you quoted from, Roswell style. Well, okay, that doesn't actually say it, but you can't have Roswell style crash wreckage and reverse engineering unless that's what Roswell was about. I think at the same time, we are getting closer and closer to uh, some kind of understanding that Roswell itself was an anomalous event. So I think there's some big things playing out there right now that um, that the people, it, well, it's interesting because clearly you could watch the hearing and get all upset and say, okay, n- nothing's ever going to happen. This is, this is just more obfuscation and it's never, it's never going to come out. But on the other hand, I think, as you said, there are things behind the scenes that we know he's aware of. And the senators who were grilling him probably also are aware of that because they've also met with some of these so-called whistleblowers. So at a certain point, that center cannot hold. Now, where it breaks, I don't know. And neither does anybody at this point, but it sure looks like it's getting closer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe it is getting closer. I mean, I, I, I don't want to sound like I'm bagging Kirkpatrick all the way through here because he is a scientist. And as a scientist, as a pure scientist, he is under that obligation to ensure that he can verify something. And frankly, even if he has walked into a, a hangar and looked at an object and said, gee, that looks pretty anomalous, but let's get it tested. Maybe he's at that stage. I don't know. But the lawyer in me is basically of the view that if you have multiple people asserting that they're aware of a codename program that has been concealed from the public and from a large chunk of congressional oversight for decades, this is the program, this is the location where the technology is kept, you don't muck around. You get in there and you get in there fast and you start looking before they can start hiding it. And I really do think we're actually at that stage right now. One of the things that's very interesting and a positive from what Kirkpatrick has talked about is he does, even though he does play down the ET possibility, he does say that um, uh, there are a few potentially anomalous cases in all domains in the cases that they're looking at. And he does say that Arrow is reviewing these cases with the highest level of objectivity, which is what he should be doing. I mean, frankly, if somebody's going to be investigating this, then you really do want them to be doing it with full academic rigor. 
But it's when he says that the current analysis of such cases provides no credible evidence thus far, thus far of extraterrestrial activity, off-world technology or objects that defy, defy the known laws of physics. That's where it starts straining credibility for me, because we already have on the record from ARO itself documents where they've acknowledged there are objects that defy the known laws of physics, objects that are basically incapable of explanation with prosaic explanations. And I'm talking here, of course, about the 2004 USS Nimitz incident and the 2014-2015 US. S. Theodore Roosevelt sightings off the east coast of the USA. It's quite clear from what we're hearing from people like Christopher Mellon and other insiders that there is a high degree of likelihood that there are objects that cannot be prosaically explained. And this is the problem, is that there are on the surface clear contradictions between what Mr. Kirkpatrick is telling Congress, admittedly not under oath, but Please remember, this man is going to have to be held to account for what he says in future years if things come out. So the simple fact is, yes, okay, that they haven't concluded yet that these are simply mundane objects that might be black projects. But have they actually gone in and kicked the tyres? And that that was my problem with this whole hearing, uh, Bryce, that, that people like former astronaut Scott Kelly didn't even bother to show up. Here you've yep. got Kristen Gillibrand. She's got the guts and the gumption to basically call a hearing, a public hearing. But frankly, I, I think this is what we call a turd tied up in a bow. This is a this is a this is an exhibition put on for the public to try and represent that they're doing adequate scrutiny and um, in, interrogation of somebody who's ostensibly responsible for holding holding the Defence Department to account. What I do know is there's a whole game being played behind the scenes right now, and I don't think that Sean Kirkpatrick is doing himself any honourable service by behaving the way he's behaving, because I frankly know he's irrelevant in the scheme of things if that's the position that he takes. He's going to be overtaken by events. Um, Congress is impatient to get to the truth of this. Nobody, I hasten to add, wants sensitive technology that might have been developed from these materials to be revealed and neither should we you know the national security interests should be imperative that essentially if there is a technology a propulsion system an energy system that can be derived from whatever this technology is then yes let's protect that but there is absolutely no reason at all now why the simple fact if it's true of a non-human intelligence that's behind this technology cannot be revealed. And that's how, where we're at today. How about a little confirmation? Look, uh, I, I, uh, I, I have to believe that um, um, our, our man who testified is not going to be on the job at Arrow all that much longer. And he may, in fact, be sacrificed uh, uh, at some point for some strategic reason. But the, I found myself watching the, uh, the testimony and thinking to myself, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be the government. I mean, we're talking about it right now because they're holding hearings and because this is the first time in a long time when the government is actually cop to something anomalous being out there. So it is interesting that the government's, uh, you know, taking steps. But I think uh, I, I would just like to underline that neither Ross nor myself are, are waiting with bated breath for every morsel that the government tosses out. In my own view, I think that the people are probably going to have to take this on for themselves. And by our own energetic attempts to resolve this mystery, uh, the government will have to go along with that. Um, the other thing is, and, and Ross, you brought this up, you said it's not like they walked into a hangar and had seen an object, which made me think about another piece of news from uh, this week. After the hearing, uh, to the best of my knowledge, a number of classified intelligence uh, people, including uh, Avril Haynes of the uh, Office of uh, the Director of National Intelligence, all trekked to where? Wright Patterson Air Force Base for a vi very high level classified briefing. And okay, probably has nothing to do with this, but let's all remember why Wright Patterson is important. It was the home of Project Blue Book, 
All right. That's where all those blue book files uh, were maintained. It's where the investigation was located. And according to some very good research done by the likes of Don Schmidt and others, uh, Wright Patterson is where the Roswell uh, wreckage was actually flown. So the idea that somebody could be going to a hangar and seeing an object, uh, well, if you're going to go anywhere, Wright Patterson would be a place. I just wondered what what is your take? Well, you know what? I'm going to tee that up, but this one other thing I wanted to say the, about that hearing, they showed a flying ball, basically, a flying metal ball. And I know that uh, many people who have been watching us know that you've investigated uh, that with some that have actually been found here on Earth. What was your take when you saw that? And uh, I guess, and then roll back into the right path thing, because I find that very intriguing as well. Okay, I know a lot more than I can reveal right now. But basically, okay. yes, the spheres are important and uh, some good work is being done right now. And um, I think that the relevance and the significance of those objects will become apparent. I've been contacted, by the way, from all over the world. I've, I've had people contact me saying they've seen these spheres. There's a guy emailed me this morning saying literally he was just standing looking up and it was only a few feet away from him and it was the solid steel sphere just floating in the air. Now, I, I didn't see this. I don't know for sure. But the simple fact is that there is an enormous number of people saying they've seen this stuff. And I love it. I've just got to love Mick West for his attempts to try and um, uh, find the earliest, quickest, mundane, prosaic explanation that he can. And uh, I noticed that he was suggesting it was probably a balloon or a party balloon that was photographed. Do you really seriously think that the Pentagon would release to the Senate uh, and suggest that this is quite possibly anomalous, uh, an image of an object, without first checking the possibility that it's a balloon? I mean, we really are at a point where, frankly, those kind of silly explanations need to be start being actively discounted. Uh, I'm told that there's been very rigorous analysis done, that these objects are being seen all over the world. And if you look online, I mean, there's a hell of a lot of people have contacted me with information that basically shows that they've seen yeah. these spheres, they've filmed them, you know, they've videoed them, photographed them. Um, there's an abundance of information that is being slowly collated that, that suggests there really is something to that. But listen, just, 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 just deal with the Wright-Patterson uh, visit sure, for yeah, a moment. Yeah. I, I agree with you. I don't think it was exclusively or anything to do with UFOs. I know that um, people who went there, representatives who went there, did go forewarned and forearmed with curly questions on UAPs, and one or two questions might have been asked about what they've got in their basement. But the key thing, the thing I think is very important, is that the consequence of that meeting was essentially an attempt, I suspect, uh, by the intelligence community to provide good optics to the uh, Congress about what they're doing to respond to the appalling leak of information by that guy, Texera, uh, Jack Texera, the 21-year-old guy who from the National Guard, who frankly, in an act of utter insanity, leaked highly sensitive, top secret SCI documents into a Discord group. I think just as a pissing competition to show his mates that he was for real. Um, unbelievable what that says about the state, the current state of the US protection of its highly classified secrets. And um, I think what the main meeting of Wright-Patterson was about was to try and provide good optics to the senior representatives of Senate committees that basically they're doing the right thing, that they're responding to that and making sure that they are going to all the efforts that they can do to properly classify material. Because that case, honestly, it's a debacle. The full story that's behind the leaking of those documents is only slowly now beginning to emerge. It's a shocker. And what it says about the integrity of the protection of secrets inside the US government is just breathtaking. And it does have relevance, and I'm sure you're wanting to talk about this, my friend. It does have relevance on the issue of UAPs too. Yeah. You know, I, I still, as, as we talk here, though, I keep, I just wrote down, think about it. Uh, since we were on like 11 days ago, we, you know, the, the discord leak, the uh, China balloon aftermath, the hearing that took place, the Wright Patterson briefing. I mean, wow, uh, things are going on. There's no question about it. Um, I just wanted to, 
uh, bounce back to the ball for a second, if you will, the, the metal balls, because uh, years ago, um, I had someone who told me a story. I, I'm just, I'm just going to give you this anecdotal story because it's the kind of stuff that's out there everywhere. Uh, he was, uh, I believe, 17 years old, and he was in his backyard uh, with a friend in the 1960s, and they were having a beer, one beer, hot summer day, one beer. And as they were sitting on the back porch, a sphere that he described as being, you know, about yay, um, started flying around in front of them you know, just flying around the backyard, flying around, and they watched it. And then being the high school kids that they were, they ran to the shed and got um, a, a net, a fishing net, and tried to capture this thing with a fishing net. You know, and these guys didn't make this up because as they described it to me, for years afterwards, one of them would always call the other uh, after a couple of years and say, um, by the way, uh, you know that thing that happened? Did that really happen? And the other would say, yeah, yeah, that really happened. And then they talk about how their families were. So we've learned to live with a high degree of craziness out there. And it's all kind of coming home to roost. Um, can I make, can other, I make a point here? Yeah. That I, I'm aware of, just so you know, I mean, as you know, yeah. we did that sphere story last year yes. and it, it is still under investigation. Yeah. Um, but I can tell you, I have had hundreds of people from all over the world contact me yeah. with photographs, videos, uh, accounts of seeing identical objects. And um, at what point do you basically go, oh, all of these crazy people are crazy? Um, all of them are, are basically saying that these were solid, intelligently controlled objects that weren't balloons. They were close enough for them to see that they were solid metallic objects. And uh, people are seeing these from all over the world. One of the guys who contacted me was in Africa, in a very remote part of Africa. Uh, this is real. I don't know what it is. But it's real, and, and and it boils down. I mean, this is a, this is the perennial issue. I mean, ultimately, the way in which people have like this have been able to be marginalised and stigmatised for years is that before the internet, it was very very easy to isolate and stigmatise and ridicule one person who came forward with a sighting, and that's what's been done. That's what's been done for most of the last seventy years. But let's have a look here, Bryce, at what's happening. The lesson of what's happening right now is that mainstream media has unwittingly colluded in that kind of ridicule, stigma, and taboo. Yeah. And frankly, I admit it, I've been part of it in my history as a journalist and mainstream media. But what's happening now is there is a tyranny of the commons. People are coming forward. They're able to post stuff on YouTube. They're able to post stuff, God forbid, on Discord, such as top secret SCI documents. You know, and, and this stuff can be posted and democratized. People can access it and make their own judgments. And the ability of the powers that be, and, and I do, they have used influence to try and constrain, and they still are, to try and constrain what the mainstream media reports. The, the ability of the powers that be now to control that narrative, to basically stop people from knowing uh, and analysing and collating information, that's going, and it's going very, very quickly. And, and the interesting thing here is that the mainstream media is making itself largely irrelevant in the way it's failing to cover this issue. It's got its head in the sand. It's still locked into that stigma. It's allowing its national security reporters to be excessively influenced by the Pentagon and the intelligence community. And while that's happening, you've got this slow rise of awareness on social media and other platforms where people are going, you know what? There's too much of this. There's so many witnesses saying the same thing. That's what's different now. There is momentum because of this wonderful technology, the internet. And, and of course, I was also a little shocked that Sean Kirkpatrick chose as one of his two clips to show a metal sphere, or at least what looked like a metal sphere. But, you know, uh, I, thinking back to the empty table that had uh, a few senators, mostly Gillibrand at one end and Sean Kirkpatrick at the other end saying, where are all these people? Why aren't they there? Well, probably because of stigma, probably because they didn't want to be associated with uh, a committee looking into the UFO issue. Uh, because politically, maybe they don't know how it's going to play yet. Um, and, and by the way, just a, a quick correction. Uh, the senator who didn't show up is Senator Mark Kelly. I believe. Oh, Scott sorry, Mark Kelly. My apologies. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. his twin brother, Scott. It, it's easy to get confused. You got two twins astronauts. Um, 
But then the other thing uh, to go along with your media analysis is uh, what did the media almost in lockstep do? They took the one paragraph that you already read from Sean Kirkpatrick, which said basically, uh, we don't have any evidence they're extraterrestrial. So the media basically just took that. That was their story. Uh, nothing to see here. They're not extraterrestrial. Uh, we're done. Move on. They didn't have a they didn't have reporters who actually knew enough about the topic to dig in and dimensionalize why he might say that or what else he knows that he's not saying or any of the things that we've been talking about here. So uh, the media just proved once again that it's still stigmatized on this uh, this topic. So it, we we are living in a time where we seem to be do, doing the one step forward and a couple of steps back and then a couple more. It, it's, it's give and take. We're not quite there yet. So uh, one of the things I, I said at the beginning is that you and I, rather than do the hot takes, I uh, wanted to think about it a little bit. So I know that you have been on the road and uh, you've probably had some time uh, in those lonely hotel rooms to think about the big picture issues, such as what what is going on here? I found myself listening to that hearing and you know other than the fact that i didn't like sean kirkpatrick i got irked that the meeting was so empty of senators who i think should be there particularly you know forget the uap slash ufo idea what 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 about the shoot downs of these so-called chinese uh balloons and so forth what and what about the leaks and all that why wouldn't that attract a full group and i just ended up getting frustrated all over again saying I feel like we're all in this alone and we have to all come together as citizens to solve the problem because the government isn't quite sure how to do this yet. That was my take. What was yours? Okay. Well, what I do know is that there was a private hearing that was held in addition to this public hearing and uh, former astronaut Kelly did attend that oh. private hearing and, and so did other members. And so there's a dog and pony show going here, mate, where you've got the public being fed that simple line from uh, Mr. Kirkpatrick, where he basically asserts that there is no credible evidence of anything anomalous. And yet behind the scenes, I know for a fact, they're being told entirely different stuff inside the private hearings. And, and so is also the Congress uh, in separate hearings. Uh, so yes, uh, Kirkpatrick uh, may be holding a line publicly for a sure. certain reason, and he may be using the um, the constraint that as a scientist, he needs very, very solid evidence to reach a highly reasoned conclusion. But to me, I mean, one of the key issues and one of the reasons for that public hearing was to essentially do a dog and pony show to basically show the public that Senator Gillibrand's still holding his feet to the fire. But the simple fact is, my friend, that as Gillibrand in her opening comments observed, the budget only requested um, enough funding to defray the operating expenses of ARO. It included almost no funds to sustain the crucial research and development necessary to support a serious investigation. And as she rightly observed, it took a letter from Secretary Austin, to Secretary Austin, that's the Secretary of the Department of Defense, from Senator Rubio, that's the Republican Senator, uh, Marco Rubio, and me and 14 other senators to get the office temporary relief for the current fiscal year. So the real issue, my friend, is, yes, maybe Dr. Kirkpatrick's got a point. Maybe the reason why he hasn't yet done the kind of scientific investigations that he needs to be able to do is because he's not being given the resources to properly evaluate it. And, and maybe the simple fact is that he's basically being gagged, that he's, he's not being given the, the things, the tools that he needs to ask the right questions. Maybe that's what's behind his frustration. And maybe that's what he was conveying to the committee members in the private hearing. And also, look, frankly, I do think we do need to acknowledge here, Bryce, that if, and I say if, if we truly are on the verge of momentous revelations about a non-human intelligence, if that really is the case, there are big decisions that need to be made because if the United States has recovered non-human technology, and I'm told that committees in the Congress have been told exactly that by multiple witnesses, if that's true, then a decision needs to be made about what the American public 
could and would and should be told about yeah. that. And it's an, it's not an easy one. I mean, I, I'm not somebody, I, as a journalist, I've learned to respect the importance of black world projects. I've learned to respect the importance of making sure that our military and our intelligence services can do things unimpeded. You know, it's 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 very easy for media to to say this should all be outed, it should all be revealed, but there are good reasons. Let let's let's acknowledge for a moment. You know, we're looking at the fact that there's a imminent war with China. Everybody seems to be talking about not if but when. There's the every possible likelihood that if the Ukrainians basically invade Crimea, that a tactical nuclear weapon might be used by Putin in in Crimea. God forbid. And what happens if the Iranians do manage to get enough um, weapons-grade uh, plutonium to be able to build a bomb before the end of this year? Do you really think the American government and the Israelis are going to allow that to go unchecked? I don't. And so we're at a very, very dangerous time right now. And I can understand why a very top committee in the US Congress is weighing up what the public could and should be told. I'm with you on all that, but I would say this. When you said it's not an easy decision as to figure out what to tell them, when to tell them, how much to tell them, and you know the, the all the forms disclosure and or confirmation could take. Remember, they've had 75 years to wrap their heads around this. So I would hope that the, this isn't the first time somebody sat or if there's a non-human intelligence out there interacting with this, this isn't the first time in 2023 that somebody's ever said, gee, I wonder how we're going to talk about this. I mean, clearly they've had a lot of time to do that. I also take your point. Uh, Sean Kirkpatrick is in a hot seat. He's in a difficult place. He is a scientist. I do give him all that. He, he wants to attack the issue is a scientific one, but it's also, remember, when you're in charge of something like Arrow, you're also a politician. You have to figure out the politics of how to do your job, and I think maybe he's going to need a little bit of help figuring that out. I do also know and want to uh, indicate that my frustrations notwithstanding, there are other people uh, who, who have taken the position that they thought the hearings, uh, the hearing, if you will, uh, poorly attended as it was, uh, still had some positives. And th those are our friends like Micah Hanks and Jeremy Corbell, who both ended up watching it saying, I can't dismiss all this. At least this is what we want the government to do. We want the government to take a look at this scientifically and try to figure out what, what's going on. So I, I, I think that is, um, that's, that's relevant and that, that's important. I, I just can't get over, though, what you just told us, though. Senator Mark Kelly, who I went off on in our last episode, and I feel like I'm about to do it again. Come on, Senator Kelly. How hypocritical is it to go to the, the classified hearing, hear all the good stuff, but not put your own reputation or your own interaction with the citizens that you represent on the line and go to the public hearing and be a part of that. And for all the other senators who were just empty chairs, my blood boils when I see that empty room. Well, maybe this is the key issue, Bryce. Maybe they don't think the public has the right to know what they do know. And I, I think there were some very telling moments in Gillibrand's opening comments that I want to point people to. She actually flagged that she intended to probe the multiple objects that were shot down over North America. And she observed, quote, it seemed that the Pentagon leadership did not turn to the AARO office to play a leading role in advising the combatant commander. We need to know whether this will continue. We need to know whether the leadership in DOD will bring Arrow into the decision-making process in a visible way. And we need to know what role Arrow will play in interagency coordination after the National Security Council Working Group disbands. Because don't forget that what happened after the shoot downs, and oh God, how quickly people forget, the US government, the president announced that he was creating an interagency working group out of the White House through the National Security Council that would be independently from Arrow investigating the circumstances of the shoot downs and what these objects were. And don't forget, my friend, we still do not know. The government, despite its promises, has not revealed what these objects were in detail. They've refused to re reveal the videos. And there's been no explanation as to why they've refused to reveal those videos. 
as I flagged in an earlier podcast, there is something very, very strange about the Alaska shoot down uh, Im image. And I'm told that um, we should be pushing very, very hard on that. There is a question mark in my mind as to whether one of those shoot downs, the Alaska shoot down, was anomalous. And you might notice that even though Gillibrand flagged in her opening remarks that she was going to be asking questions about that, we didn't even get answers to that. Now, that's the problem is the public allows these things to be flagged in a public hearing by the senator presiding. And frankly, the media should have been there to hold that this was a great opportunity to actually get a final answer on what the hell those objects were that were shot down over the US. And it's the lack of inquisitiveness by the mainstream media that nominally have carriage of coverage of this issue that I think is the real problem because they completely failed. The other issue that Gillibrand also flagged was that the filters on radar systems were adjusted to essentially lower the sensitivity for detection and tracking of objects. Um, and, and so that, that's the first time that that happened. And so the reason why we missed these objects in those February shoot downs, the reason why they were able to move across the continental USA was because NORAD, the US Air Force, had turned the sensitivity to a level where it wouldn't detect them. Now, we still don't have answers as to why the agency most entrusted with the defense of the United States had turned the sensitivity of its sensor systems to the point where they wouldn't pick up dangerous objects, national security, flight safety threatening objects moving across the United States. And my big disappointment out of Gillibrand's committee hearing was that in the public hearing, we didn't get answers even now to those questions. It's now April. It's and months on from those February shoot downs and we still don't have answers. We still don't have the videos and we still don't know why the US Air Force and the NORAD adjusted the sensitivity to stop themselves from detecting things that are, as everybody now knows, a threat to the national security and flight safety of the United States. That's it's the so, big question. It's a big question and it's so irritating. I mean, I just have to remind us all again, it was last month when uh, a Russian jet poured a bunch of fuel on one of our drones and we released the video of that within two days, maybe even a day. Uh, so here we are several months past what we're spoke, what's being sold to us is the shoot downs of weather balloons and we can't see that video. Uh, we know it exists, but we can't see it. I don't get it. That's why the public uh, is probably going to be mad. The public isn't likely to get mad when they're told the truth about something. They may be scared, they may have other uh, feelings, but not apt to be mad. What, what gets people mad is uh, not being told things that are important to them as they make decisions about their lives. So, you know, if the government really didn't know what was going on at all and had no theories and this was a brand new thing, then I guess we could all cut a lot of slack as we began to investigate this. But that isn't the case. We all know this. We've gone over it many times on this show about how the history of this goes back with tens of thousands of good sightings with all the we, you know, with all the good witnesses that you can imagine from uh, pilots to police officers. And it's just, it's it's getting old and uh, people are ready to, to learn a little bit more about that. So um, we, you know, people like you and I, we could say this over and over, but at some point we need to take this action together. We need, you know, I'm not an activist about ET. I'm not advocating that this is ET. I'm just advocating for transparency. I'm advocating for truth. I'm advocating for confirmation. If there's a big, dirty little secret that there's a non-human intelligence, I'd like to know. And if the government and the people who have studied it are able to say after 75 years, we don't know any more than that. We can't figure it out. We've tried to reverse engineer this stuff. We're not having any luck with it. If that's what they want to tell us, Let's start there, but at least confirm it. So, uh, yeah, uh, it, it's I, I sound like a broken record on this show sometimes because all of these um, issues that we have to deal with kind of go back to the beginning. Our representatives historically, and it isn't just in the United States, and it's in your own country in Australia, and it's in countries throughout the world. Uh, countries have not, uh, governments have not been forthcoming on this issue, and it's probably time to, 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 
to start talking about it in a more open way. And, you know, I know our time is wrapping up. Can we, can, do we dare do a little cultural dissection? Can we talk about Tucker Carlson and Don Lemon? Can I, can I just make one point first yeah, before sure. you go to that? One of the great lessons from American history is that secrets have a way of wriggling out into the open. Daniel Ellsberg leaked the Pentagon Papers that revealed yeah. just what the US Defense Department knew about the catastrophe of Vietnam. It was eventually leaked that uh, the CIA and other agencies had had grave misgivings all along that there were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. The truth has a way of coming to the surface. And if there's a lesson from the debacle of the Jack Texera case, where essentially a young man, a 21-year-old man, can gain, gain access to highly classified, top-secret SCI documents, it's that even the most sensitive documents in the US government can and will leak eventually. And one of the best ways of controlling those kind of leaks and stopping them is to give the public the reassurance that you're being open and transparent and accountable. I mean, I don't understand the motivations of a young man who leaks things like that, but uh, what I do understand is a public that is inflamed and angry that they're being misled and probably being lied to on the issue of UAPs. The government has an integrity issue here. It has an honourable moment in history where it can make a decision to be frank and candid with the American public about what it knows. We're not going to cop another Condon inquiry where essentially scientists are used to dress up a lame explanation and to fob us off. That's not going to happen. And so I really do think we're at a crucial moment in history here where either they want this to catastrophically leak into the public domain in a way that they can't control, or maybe they should take a lead in government and defence. Maybe they should be talking to media advisors and crisis managers and thinking about the best way of disseminating this message. Because we're good people. Bryce and I don't want to see national security secrets leaked. We don't want to see good people's reputations trashed for no good reason. What we do want to see is truth being told to the American public and to the rest of the world. Do you think there is a possibility that the way this thing goes down eventually is by some kind of leak of an incontrovertible document that confirms the otherness of this phenomena? What I am saying is there's an opportunity here for responsible political leadership, executive leadership, to control the narrative in a responsible way. Right. But to patronise and to try to bully and intimidate and, and use ridicule and stigma to stop people from publishing a story, it's no longer going to hold. This story is going to break whether they like it or not. That's... And they can be responsible or they can be irresponsible. And the big lesson with the people in intelligence and defense is that when they to try and cover their own asses, when they try and protect themselves and protect their reputations, the story still gets out. So here's the honorable moment for you in history, you people, you gatekeepers. That that's what I think. You know, I, I wrote a book about it, AD After Disclosure, and Rich Dolan and I, who was my co-author on that, we spent weeks discussing, well, how is the right way to do this? What's going to trigger it? And it's very interesting at the, without boring everybody with all that, and we can do that later, but we did come to the, the, this feeling that talking about UFOs to the public was impossible and yet it was inevitable. You know, it's, it's that super contradiction. And I, I think that's still true. I think there are people probably within the department of defense who are saying you can't possibly talk the truth about this thing, it, it just can't be controlled and it will unleash things. But I think uh, more and more people on the inside are indeed coming to the conclusion that there's no way to keep this bottled up. So the question is, uh, how are we going to transition to the world where we accept uh, whatever the truth may turn out to be? So, yeah, uh, we are there. And just, just to address quickly, Tucker, yeah. Tucker Carlson's passing. Yeah. The one thing about Tucker Carlson, whatever you thought of him, he had an audience of three and a half million or such like. Right. It was the second, second most watched program in the United States. What he said mattered. 
And one of the issues that he focused on was UAPs. He gave a lot of coverage and a lot of credibility to people coming on his program talking about the issue of UAPs. And you know what? His audience loved it. They wanted it. And they right. told him they wanted more. And full credit to him for doing that, because as a journalist, he had the courage to go against the grain. And yeah, there was an article in Politico this week saying that people in the Pentagon were celebrating the fact that, that Tucker Carlson had gone. And well, well they may have done. Well, may okay. they, they may have done. Just, uh, just, to correct, just to clarify for everyone, Tucker Carlson isn't dead. I mean, he's fired. He's going to pop I'm up someplace else. No, no, I know, he'll pop up somewhere else. Sounds like yeah. it. it sounds like we're doing his obituary. The truth is, Tucker Carlson's going to show up someplace else soon, and he's probably going to keep talking about this. And and he was a mixed bag, uh, and uh, for for many reasons on the UFO topic. Not the least of which is he was accused by others of saying, "Well, he's willing to float all these." conspiracy theories. So then it, it kind of marginalized the UFO thing into the conspiracy ghetto, if you will. But um, nonetheless, he was willing to talk about it openly. And I, I think that's to be uh, commended. And in contrast, Don Lemon, who was just fired from uh, CNN uh, at the same exact time as Carlson was being fired from Fox, I saw uh, Don Lemon and uh, do the handoff to Chris Cuomo on their respective shows on CNN uh, back when Cuomo was still on about a year ago, I guess. And it, there was some uh, UAP news that was out there. And they sort of used that as their handoff, the sort of the anchor. OK, what do you got? What are you what are you talking about? And they both both uh, Don Lemon and Chris Cuomo had smiles on their faces and were acting like, oh boy, this is, uh, this is something I don't want to get into. It's a little too crazy for me. So I'll, I'll, I'll take Carlson's admitting that there's a mystery and that we should give it some uh, reasonable talk over Don Lemon's uh, snickering about it. Uh, so, you know, let's, let's hope um, that out of this kind of news, uh, more journalists are prepared to to treat this in a responsible way. Uh, nobody is saying that we have the answers. I'm not even saying that I think the government has the answers. I do think they probably have more answers than I have because they've been at it a lot longer. They've been they've been researching this since before I was born. And, and in fact, there's reports written by the US government, again, since before I was born, where they actually say they think it's extraterrestrial. So if it's not, I'd like to hear why they now think after the 75 years of, of looking into it, they don't think that anymore. So um, all I can say, uh, Ross, is the only good news for you and me is it means we got many, many, many more shows to come. And on that note, I think it's time to wrap, my friend. Let's say goodbye and we'll see you all in the next Need to Know. Thanks a lot. Good to talk to you.
Mystery solved. Those eerie lights, just a lost weather balloon. An Air Force spokesman confirms tonight that this was no flying saucer. Sports is next. Just a well, the Air Force says, you know what you know. The lights, the sky, the hat on, the flying saucer, the sun counter, the chest rest, the close encounter, the chest rest, 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 Look at that thing. It's rotating. We can't handle the truth. People get ready.